I was once a dinosaur, a stegosaurus to be exact. My uncomfortably snug green jumpsuit, with floppy fabric plates sewn along the back, was far from scientifically accurate, but that wasn't important. I had the dinosaur spirit. That's what counted. I had been tapped as one of the main players in an Allosaurus vs. Stegosaurus battle set for my preschool's dinosaur night. It was yet another chance to coerce my parents to let me frolic among dinosaurs. My teachers had hidden little plastic dinosaurs in the shallow sandbox dig site, and everyone got a box of bland dinosaur cereal at the end of the night, but if there's any educational subtext, I can't remember it. That didn't matter to me at the time. Who needs a reason to play with dinosaurs when you're a five-year-old prehistory fanatic? I was ready to roar, stomp, and swing my spiky tail at the Allosaurus kid in a Jurassic death match when I noticed that he was dressed in an identical costume. My opponent looked nothing like the nimble hypercarnivore with steel trap jaws he was supposed to be. My teachers hadn't done their homework. And I didn't agree with my scripted defeat at the claws of Allosaurus either. At the moment of my mock death, when the script called for me to fall and bear my reptilian throat to my attacker, I decided to break character and try to convince my audience that Stegosaurus was really the superior dinosaur. Allosaurus was fierce and fast, I explained, but those attributes would have been of little use against the prominent plates and bone-piercing tail spikes of Stegosaurus. Alas, the assembled adults didn't appreciate my impromptu dinosaurology lesson. I was hoping the grown-ups would sagely nod their heads in agreement and recommend me for a post at the American Museum of Natural History in New York City, but they just laughed. I didn't shake my fist and scream, Fools, I'll show you all, as I felt in my heart a true scientist should do. But I didn't give up on dinosaurs either. I nurtured my dinomania with documentaries, delighted in the dino-themed B-movies I brought home from the video store, and tore up my grandparents' backyard in my search of a perfect triceratops nest. Never mind that the classic three-horned dinosaur never roamed central New Jersey, or that the few dinosaur fossils found in the state were mostly scraps of skeletons that had been washed out into the Cretaceous Atlantic. My fossil hunter's intuition told me there just had to be a dinosaur underneath the topsoil, and I kept on excavating my pit. That is, until I got the hatchet out of my grandfather's tool shed and tried to cut down a sapling that was in my way. My parents bolted out of the house and put a stop to my excavation. Apparently, I hadn't filled out the proper permits before I started my dig. That's not to say that my parents didn't otherwise support my fossil infatuation. They encouraged my paleontological dreams— and I will always cherish the memory of them defending my book choices when my elementary school's librarian complained that I was checking out too many dinosaur titles that were supposedly above my reading level. My brain ached with the need to know everything there was to know about dinosaurs. Every new dinosaur name I learned became a scientific incarnation, a magic word that immediately conjured up terrible, marvelous, scaly monsters in my imagination. Two and a half decades later, my wife now copes with the dinosauriana that is rapidly radiating out from my desk and creeping into every room of our Salt Lake City apartment. My dinosaur dreams factored into our decision to move here, too. When people ask me why in the world I'd want to move to Utah, a place whose Mormon legacy includes maddeningly conservative politics and near beer, my answer is very simple. For the dinosaurs. With apologies to Horace Greeley, my rationale for coming to Utah was Go west, young man, and grow up with the dinosaurs. The Beehive State is home to some of the richest dinosaur-bearing formations anywhere, all laid out in arid, colorful badlands. And while other couples might go back and forth about whether they can afford a new couch or television, I tend to spend hours trying to wear down my wife's financial resolve to let me bring home essential items like a full-size cast of an apatosaurus skull from an estate sale. The plaster sauropod head now sits triumphantly atop one of my paleontology-dedicated bookshelves. I only get to join the search for more dinosaurs when the weather allows, though. After October, the weather is too cold to go prospecting, and the ground is too hard to safely extricate fossils. To pass the time, I spend my winters writing about the rushing flow of new paleo papers, anxiously awaiting spring. Every new field season brings new possibilities— Despite what you might expect from more than a century of fossil hunting in the American West, there are still many dinosaurs left to discover. I haven't found that Triceratops nest just yet, but now I live in a place one step closer to my dreams, where Earth's history is thrust up and exposed in beautiful, fossil-rich swaths. Only, dinosaurs aren't supposed to be part of adulthood. Paleontologists and volunteer dinosaur diggers are often seen as overgrown children, 
who somehow found a way to make a profession out of playing in the dirt and dreaming of snaggletooth horrors treading through primordial ooze. American kids are expected to go through a dinosaur phase, but we're due to give that up once we discovered team sports and kissing under the high school bleachers. My natural awkwardness prevented me from doing either of those things. An awakening to cathartic music, the sheer terror of dating, and a concentrated push to narrow down dreams into viable career options are scheduled to take over and sweep out all the childhood clutter. Let's face it, dinosaurs have been culturally demarcated as kitschy kid stuff, triggers for nostalgia and ironic whimsy, but not a subject to take seriously. At least not until the former dinosaur fans have kids of their own and take their broods to see the real-life monsters that stalk museum halls. The dinosaurs they grew up with are gone, replaced by creatures that look entirely different and sometimes don't even carry the same names. The dinosaurs we meet as children don't stay around long. Science is always tweaking and refining them, giving us a jolt when we're expecting comforting memories. I experienced a similar shock when my once girlfriend Ellen took me to the American Museum of Natural History's Dinosaurs on New Year's Day 2003. I hadn't visited the halls since I was a kid, and in the intervening years the museum had renovated its fossil exhibits. The skeletons that had so inspired me as a youngster had received a fantastic makeover. Tyrannosaurus Rex, as I first met her, reared back in a Godzilla pose, fang-lined jaws held high and tail dragging on the ground. The stegosaurus I encountered on the same visit looked like a mound of plates and spikes, while the low-slung brontosaurus stood there stupidly, looking out of place on dry land rather than in a fetid, weed-choked pool. The dinosaurs I grew up with lived in a humid, slow-motion nightmare of teeth, claws, and horns. All had been replaced by unfamiliar visions of Mesozoic life. Dinosaurs that stood tall and frozen in mid-stride, as if their flesh had suddenly fallen off as they sauntered through their world. The new dinosaurs, poised in active skeletal snapshots, were strangers to me.